good morning or evening, whichever the case is for you. <clears throat> we are back at uh, the wilderness, Bamidbar, numbers 12 through 14. This is, uh, what's today, April 21st. Next Sunday, my wife Julie will be teaching, and I'll remind you that at the end of this today, and uh, then I'll be back in the class uh, two weeks from today. But we're picking up our story of uh, the children of Israel, where they get to the promised land, and they uh, are commanded by the Father to send in 12 uh, pre-trip planners. We call them spies, but they were pre-trip planners. They weren't to decide whether or not to go. They were just supposed to go in and, and uh, help the children of Israel with their two to three million people figure out how the, they were going to enter the land and, and you know, what, would, would they be able to start planting crops and what kind of land did the farming and trees and, and uh, what kind of people would they encounter? Well, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. Just say, let's just don't even wait. <laughs> let's go tomorrow and possess it for we are all, we are well able to overcome it. Caleb was of the tribe of Judah. We know the line of the tribe of Judah. Now, he was a Kenite uh, that was grafted into the tribe of Judah. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the men that went up with him said, we're not able to go up against these people for they're stronger than we are. The other hidden spies, as they're called. <clears throat> and they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it, it's a land that eaten that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Whoa. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature, all of them. All we saw were giants. And there we saw the, the giants, the sons of Anak, the Anakim, which, which come of the giants. And we were on our own side as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. You can Google and find a lot of information about uh, giants and we tend to you know think well giants and dinosaurs they if they were giants they were all killed in the flood but what about what what about the giants were were they real how big were they there's a lot of evidence about giants and uh here's just one uh this is one of many 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 this uh this man is um he's from texas joe taylor and uh, the late 1950s, during construction in Turkey, you know, many, many tombs containing the remains of giants were uncovered. At two sites, the leg bones were measured to be about 120 centimeters or 47 inches long. Um, this giant stood some 14 to 16 feet tall and had 20 to 22 inch long feet. Now, the biblical record in Deuteronomy 3.11 states that the iron bed of Og king of Bashan was nine cubits um, by four cubits, approximately 14 feet long by six feet wide. Um, and there are archaeological uh, accounts of giants even up to 30 feet and, and just huge. Um, according to scriptures, there were Nephilim or giants in the earth, and this is where they came from, that when the sons of God, fallen angels, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. That word renown in English sounds like, oh, well, they were of a great reputation. Well, they were of a reputation. It wasn't a great reputation uh, that we would desire. But um, it's just suffice it to say that um, we are in this fallen spirit world. Um, there are demonic activities. They're demonic possessed people. And I believe that um, some way, shape, or form, Nephilim are still uh, roaming in this world. And um, not to say that every seven-foot basketball player is a is a uh, giant or like this. I don't know if this guy's 4'11", makes this guy seem even taller. But just suffice it to say that... Um, that there were giants, and I believe that this underworld, spirit world, even the connection to, into our physical world, yeah, it would be safe to say that this world is still inhabited by Nephilim. And um, there's so many things yet to happen 
in the end times in Revelation. We don't necessarily read about the Nephilim returning, but we hear an awful lot about uh, demonic activity and people. You know, Judas was possessed of the devil. The Antichrist is just just a normal person that is demon possessed, or is it a person that uh, originated out of uh, the the place of the of, of Satan's realm? in the underworld a lot of questions we have about that but this put great fear into the children of israel going into the promised land and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night why were they crying why were they weeping they thought well we've been waiting we've been delivered we've been through a lot we're tired we're exhausted um we're hungry um and we were about to go into this beautiful land, and now all our dreams, hopes, and wishes have been dashed. And so they are very distraught. And they begin murmuring against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword? We're going we're to die of starvation, but we're also, these giants are going to kill us and eat us. Our wives and our children should be prey. We're not better for us to be turned to Egypt. Maybe we'd be better off to go back to Egypt. And they said to one another, let us make a captain. This is mutiny, I guess. They said, let us make a new leader, not Moses, and let us return to Egypt. Notice the progression of what these people did. It's very similar to what still goes on today and what we go through, perhaps. There is a faith among these people. They've, well, they had to have some faith. Um, they believed the God that protected them through, uh, through the ten plagues in Egypt. And they were spared. Death passed over their homes. They were freed. They uh, saw the parting of the Red Sea. So they had faith. But I put a question mark here because how deep was it? Um, their faith started getting tainted by human reasoning. This can very much happen to us today. Humanism, reasoning, logic. People can talk you out of your faith, perhaps. And then it gets corrupted. And that becomes sin, which leads to death. Now, this is the progression, a doubting faith. We don't want to have doubting faith. We don't want to be like doubting Thomas. You know, we, our, you know, it's like either hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm. Don't, be, don't have a little faith. We need to be sold out and surrendered. And so doubting faith would be like, well, I don't feel like I used to about all this. You know, taking this land and coming out of Egypt, we were excited about it, but now I'm having second thoughts. Looks like we're going to die. Why didn't we just stay in Egypt and die? Maybe God isn't with us anymore. Maybe he isn't real. Maybe God is just continually going to punish for what we did with the golden calf. Um, just maybe, maybe, maybe doubts creeping in. And uh, that can happen to us today. You know, there, people may get saved uh, an emotional, highly charged event at a revival and then sometime later, I don't feel like I used to about this salvation thing. So there, there's faith, but sometimes that faith can be questionable. Secondly, there, it, faulty reasoning can come in to the picture. Perhaps it would be better to go back to Egypt. Not that Egypt is great, but what does it matter where we die if we're going to die? We will be slaves again, but at least we will not all die. So this, they, they start reasoning with this, but it's got holes in it, and it's faulty, and it's, it's not the kind of reasoning that the Father uh, wants for his chosen people to start reasoning against him. Then it comes to a bad decision. Well, let's get a new leader and go back to Egypt. That's a very bad decision. And it, lastly, that leads to death, departing. From, uh, departure from where God is is what that says. Uh, I remember Henry, it was Henry Blackaby said, "Find out where God is and go there." That's our our challenge in life. Seek God, go where He is. Don't just uh, let God come along and help you in your plans. No, you must surrender your will, die to self, and go where God has for you. 
Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, they rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company, and they standing up to all the children of Israel, saying, No, 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 the land which we pass through to search it is exceedingly good land. And if Yahweh delights in us, then he will bring us into this land. He'll give it to us. The land flows of milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. And Yahweh is with us. Fear them not. They're bred for us. We're going to eat them up. They're not going to eat us up. We're going to eat them up because we are with the majority with our God, our great God who brought us out of Egypt, protected us through the, the plagues, um, saved us from the Egyptian army. See, these guys are full of strong faith, unwavering faith. The others are being pulled away by their reasoning. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Oh my goodness. They're wanting to stone Joshua and Caleb and turning on them in such a violent way. And I highlighted this because what a what a um, opposite. The congregation bade stone them with stones and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Doesn't that seem like no, the glory of the Lord would depart from them if they're acting like this. What do you make of this? Is it possible for the glory of the Lord to appear before a whole congregation and either they don't see the glory of the Lord or they see it, but it doesn't have any effect on them? Well, that would be pretty bad. Or the, the Father's just not pleased with them, which, which is a worse situation. They, they are not responding to their God who is among them. And why would the glory of the Lord appear to them? I think it's it can be compared like, you know, the relationship of a father and his child. He's already declared, I'm, I'm going to be your father to these children of Israel. You're my people. If a father has disobedient children and he comes into the room, he may be coming into the room to bring some discipline, but by his coming into the room, he's saying, I'm still your father. And I want to give you correction. I still love you. Remember, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. If children are disobedient and the father says, well, I'm through with you. I want to go get me some more children. I don't ever want to see you again. That, that is, um, that's unheard of, isn't it? A father and his children, he may be present with them to bring discipline. And that's really what's going to go on here. The glory of the Lord, when he appears, it's the Father. He comes in glory. And Yahweh said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? I will smite them with the pestilence and disherit them, and I'll make of you, Moses, a greater nation and mightier than they. Now, where else did a similar exchange happen between Moses and Yahweh? Yahweh. A similar exchange like this, where God is saying, Moses, I'm going to let me wipe out these people. I'm going to start over with you. Well, it happened in Exodus 32 uh, after the golden calf is what that says. And here's the scripture. I don't know if I can read it behind my picture there. And Yahweh said to Moses, I've seen this people. Indeed, they are stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and consume them. And I will make of you. A great nation. Then Moses uh, pleaded with Yahweh his Elohim and said, Yahweh, why does your wrath burn hot against these whom you brought out of Egypt, out of the, the land of Egypt, with great power? Uh, and and you know why? He, Moses begins being concerned about the father's reputation, or his rep, not, not his own reputation, but the reputation of God. And Moses said to Yahweh, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. For you brought up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that the, that thou, Yahweh, art among this people, that thou, Yahweh, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, pillar by day and a pillar of cloud by night. Your reputation is out there. If you kill all these people at one time, like killing one man, then the nations which have heard 
the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because Yahweh was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware to them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of Adonai be great according as thou hast spoken, saying. Now, it seems odd to us that here's Moses negotiating with Yahweh, explaining to Yahweh that his reputation, God's reputation among the heathen would be discredited as if Yahweh needs to be instructed by Moses. Come on. I can only understand this as it being a test for Moses to see where his heart was in regard to the sin of the people. I believe that Moses passed this test and that his greatest concern is uh, for the reputation of Yahweh. He's concerned for what it would mean to Yahweh's reputation. And so this is a test for Moses. I believe he passed it. Yahweh is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. This is Moses' prayer for them, interceding for the people that they could be pardoned for their lack of faith. The phrase, the sins of the fathers are visited on children to the third and fourth generation is commonly cited as coming from Exodus 20, which is part of the second commandment of the Ten Commandments of having no other gods um, before me. And um, But the passage is interpreted to mean that people may have ancestral curses because of the activities of their fathers or ancestors. Things one generation had, uh, did can easily be passed down to the next generation. This passage is also found in Numbers. That's where we are here. And Deuteronomy 5, 9, where it says, uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, is what it says in Deut Deuteronomy. However, the passage is also interpreted to mean that God does forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but does not, uh, I think that word is excuse the guilty and lays the sins of the parents upon the children and their grandchildren. And what does this mean? This can be explained simply by the understanding of what one generation abhors, the next generation might just tolerate, and the next generation might just accept. We've seen that over and over again. Take language, for instance. Our grandparents would no more have used the verbiage in the language that perhaps our parents did. And look at the children today. You've got children today that what they what comes out of their mouths, they ought to be washed out with soap. Where do they get that? Well, their parents use some of that language. And those parents may say, well, my parents use a little bit of it, but yeah, you know, we've gotten a little slack. It reminds uh, us of that poem, Sin is a monster of such awful mien that to be hated need only be seen, but seen too often familiar with face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. You know, 50 years ago, um, people living out of wedlock was totally unacceptable. Even in our secular society, it just was looked down upon. But now, um, to live together before marriage, well, that's totally accepted. Their parents, their Christian parents, that um, know that they're, well, my child's going to be promiscuous. I can't go with them ever. I just want to make sure that they don't get caught so I can you know, give them birth control pills um, so that they don't get uh, unwed pregnancies. You know, one generation to the next, there's kind of a dumbing down. And I think all that is wrapped up in this visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation. Um, we are to teach our children dil diligently the ways of the stack pole, the, the standard, and that is to be found in the Torah, in God's Word, in the Bible. So people want to say, oh, well, parts of the Bible aren't for today. You know, the whole thing about homosexuality. A homosexual believer, there are some claim to be Christians that are homosexual. They say, well, the, the, the verbiage about 
you know, sodomy and, and man lying with man being an abomination. That's not what that meant. Uh, and that was for their generation. That's not for us today. Things have changed. You know, picking and choosing to believe is creating God in your own image and taking a Bible and cutting it up and just believing what you want to believe. And so I believe, I believe that the Father's calling us back to the ancient paths. That's why we spend so much time studying the Torah to see. And some of it is very hard to understand. Uh, and how we can apply it. But our position is such, well, there's nothing wrong with the word of God, how it came out of his mouth, but there could be a lot wrong with me and my ability to understand it and process it. So help me, help me in my unbelief and my lack of faith. Help me to be stronger. Let me be more like Joshua and Caleb. And Yahweh said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, so he's going to forgive them, as, as truly as, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of Yahweh. And I put this parenthesis because in a different translation it says, I solemnly swear that all the earth shall be filled with the glory of Yahweh. He knows the end from the beginning. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, they've tempted me now ten times. And have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Now, here's the question. What, um, so seeing miracles does not always produce faith. These people saw miracles. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. Seeing a, a physical miracle does not always Seeing is believing is what we'll say. Well, I'll believe it when I see it. Seeing miracles didn't always produce heartfelt, true, genuine faith. And when he said, these people have tempted me 10 times, well, that begs the question, what were the 10 times that they tempted or tested God or tried his patience? What were they? So I've got them listed here. Exodus 14 at the Red Sea, they doubted. Most they were, they said, because there are no graves in Egypt, you've taken us to die in the wilderness. They saw the sea before them, so they were doubting that anything could be done to save them. They doubted. Secondly, once they crossed the Red Sea, now they're out in the wilderness. They're at Marar. They complained for water. They came through the Red Sea, but then the people murmured against Moses. Say, what are we going to drink? Then they were in the wilderness of sin. They complained for more food. The whole congregation of children of Israel murmured against Moses in the wilderness. They said, would to God that we died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. We sat by flesh pots. We did eat bread to the full. And now we're out here starving. Then came the manna that tested them. Did, they didn't follow the instructions to gather daily. Moses said, let, uh, let no man, let me get my pointer. Let no man uh, leave it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms, and it stank. Moses was wroth with them. They disobeyed and, and then gathered on the Sabbath. It came to, to pass, they went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. So they, they're just doubting, disbelieving, and the Lord said to them, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? Then they came to Rephidim. That's where they complained about thirst. And he struck the rock and the water came. But they were complaining. They, they thought they were going to die of thirst in the, in the wilderness. Then came the golden calf. A huge uh, example of their doubting. Moses was gone 40 days. We, we don't know what became of him. We need a God that we can worship. So they, um, they created the golden calf. And worshiped it. Then they complained about their hardships at Tabera. And when the people complained, it displeased Yahweh. And Yahweh heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of Yahweh burnt among them. And then they get to where there's no meat to eat. This was a couple weeks ago. We're talking about the quail that he blew in for them. And then they ate until it was coming out of their nostrils. Uh, the mixed multitude was among them. They fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again. Who will give us flesh to eat? And then we get to number 10. This is the bad report of the 10 spies or the 10 uh, pre-trip planners. And so that's what he said. They've tempted me these 10 times, these major times. 
And Yahweh said, I have pardoned according to thy word. I'm going to forgive them. But he said, surely they shall not see the land that I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. So there are consequences for their sin. He's going to forgive them. But they're not going to see the promised land. They're actually going to die in the wilderness. The curse upon the generation that rebelled and tested Yahweh, even though they came out of Egypt by Yah's hand and they were set free, there were consequences for their, their disbelief and their murmuring and their complaining. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, I'd say that's the Holy Spirit, and had followed me fully, him will I bring into the land where he went. Now, this this verse right here, Joshua is not mentioned, although he does get to see the land. And he's mentioned here in a number of couple of verses. But this highlight of Caleb could be a prophetic word here because Caleb was a Kenite, a Gentile. The Gentiles are going to be given a spirit, the Holy Spirit, and they shall come in and possess the land. It could be a prophetic word there um, because Caleb was grafted in. He's grafted into the tribe of Judah, but he was originally a Gentile. Now the Amal Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. And he says, so now God is going to give them new orders, new commandment. He says, tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Go back down towards the Red Sea where you came from and I'll give you further instructions. But you're not going to go ahead and take this land. And Yahweh spake to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation? which they murmur. I've heard their murmurings. They murmur. I mean, I highlight all this murmuring. And he says, according to the, your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Except Caleb, and he, this is where he mentions Joshua, except Caleb and Joshua. But your little ones, the innocence of these little ones, um, I'm going to bring them in, and they shall know the land which ye have despise but up here back i kind of skipped over this he tells them your carcasses those that murmured and complained their carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and all that were numbered of you he said so we're not to complain about our struggles words mean things be very careful about what we say and what we lash out and blame god for um we don't want to be found murmuring. that's why this lesson is here for us to read we don't want to be like that and i highlight it here their murmuring is just not general complaining. They are murmuring against God every time. They are complaining to God. Um, we've heard people say, well, man, you know, sometimes God understands. He knows our heart, and it's okay for us to get mad at God and shake our fist at God. Um, I would be careful with that. Um, according to this, it's uh, there may be repercussions. You may find forgiveness for being angry at your Creator. Um, you can seek his forgiveness and repent, but there still may be consequences. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness, after the number of the days in which ye searched the land. See, if anyone to ask you, why did the children of Israel wander for 40 years? Here's the answer. 40 year, uh, each day for a year, you're going to wander 40 years. Uh, a year for each day and ye shall know see the curse upon the whole camp but uh includes a continuance of judgment upon the children of those that sinned for 40 and the men which moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land they died by the plague before yahweh um, what happened to them? The, the complainers, the faithless, their lives were cut short. Now, you know, the, there's that issue of pardoning and, and forgiveness, but there are consequences for sins. Their lives were cut short. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, which were of the men that were to search the land, and Moses told these things unto all the children of Israel, they lived still. They, they entered into the promised land. Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. Their murmuring now turned to just mourning, sorrow. The people mourned. Does this mean they were sorry and wanted forgiveness, or just that they were miserable? In this context here, they still, you know, they were facing going back to the, to the wilderness. 
they mourned greatly. They were maybe they realized we were so close yet so far. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up to the top of the mountain and said, Lo, we be here and we'll go up to the place. And it says they, it was, it was a lot of the people that were murmuring, that were complaining that we can't take it. Now they have a change of heart. Their confession of sin indicates that they were indeed sorry and they sought repentance. They said, we have sinned. And they went up there and said, Lo, we're, we're here. Um, but what did they want to do? They wanted to try to fix it themselves and say, okay, we're going to go in and try to take this land. Moses said, well, why do you now transgress the, the, the latest commandment of Yahweh? But it shall not prosper. Don't go up there. The Lord's not among you. You, you be not smitten before the enemies. The Amalekites and Canaanites, they're there before you. You're going to fall by the sword because you're turned away from Yahweh. Therefore, Yahweh will not be with you. What happened here? Their repentance was on their terms. That is not true repentance, which is the surrender of our will to do the will of the Father. These people did not do 180 degree repentance away from sin to God. They sort of did a 340. They turned to something different, but they did not turn directly to the Father, to Yahweh. Some of the Israelites were now earnest to go forward toward Canaan, but it came too late. If men would but be as earnest for heaven while their day of grace lasts as they will be when it's over, how well would it be for them? That's Matthew Henry's commentary on this episode. Two things, finally, um, before we have a song on this, uh, two points. Everything must be done according to Yah's plan. Everything. It's got to be done to his will. Not my will, but thine. And his timing. Once he declared that they were to wander for 40 years, they needed to understand that that was now his commandment to them to go wander for 40 years. He would still provide for them. Still going to be their God. They would be his people. But there are definite consequences when we disobey God's will. It's kind of like uh, a young lady that Julie and I counseled years ago in, in Texas. Got pregnant out of wedlock and um, she was very sorrowful. We met with her and counseled with her, but we tried to really clarify with her, wanted to for her sake, was she sorry that she got caught and got pregnant or was she sorry that she had sinned, she and her boyfriend? And where was he? You know, this was kind of just dealing with her. And so, you know, there is a difference between, um, it's like um, I've been asked to marry some couples uh, it, from time to time. And my first question has become to be, it's come to be, uh, are you living together or are they living together? And if they are, I say, I can't marry them. Um, if, uh, you know, they're asking me to ask God to bless something he can't bless. But I've met with a couple I remember that said, well, if, you know, wedding plans were in place, they wanted me to do, if you will separate from one another for three months time, then I, I, I believe God would honor that. And that's because they, they kind of said they wanted their wedding to get off on the right foot. Well, they really didn't, didn't adhere to that well till the last week or so. I, it was one of the first weddings I'd ever done. And, and I did the wedding. Six months later, they got divorced, and I've always just uh, hated that, um, that I didn't make it more clear, uh, and I, I want you to separate one another because you recognize this as sin, not just to please me, that you recognize you've sinned against the Father by living in promiscuity. Um, people don't want to talk about living together being pr promiscuity or disobedient to, to the Father, but... Um, we need to understand that everything must be done according to his plan. And his plan can be found, his principles, his teachings, within these words we've been studying in his Torah. Secondly, how would God's people be described today? Are there fewer like Joshua and Caleb and more like those that gave the bad report? I think the answer is probably obvious. It's going to be few that those that find it, the way of life, truth, faith. But who do we want to be like? Let's be like Joshua and Caleb. I'm going to leave you with this song. Um, it's, got, it's a beautiful arrangement of Have Thine Own Way. Not my way. Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. And uh, so then i got a slide that just says, uh, reminds you that Julie's going to be teaching next week. Pray for me while I'm in Puerto Rico. 
with the singing, South Carolina Baptist Singing Churchman, and I'll see you in two weeks. Thanks. Bye. than snow